Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Good morning and Merry Christmas. My name is Alex Meredith, a minister with the Marquette Church of Christ. I want to welcome you to uh, our program, Let the Bible Speak. Um, now, there's always been controversy within Christianity about whether the church should uh, formally celebrate Christmas or not. Uh, there are some people who say, well, his birth probably wasn't even in the winter. It was probably in the spring or summer. Uh, it has its origins and is pagan history and all of that. And, uh, and then there are other people who say, well, it's about something good and wholesome and biblical. And so, and people are already thinking about it and they're in a more charitable mood. So why not direct their thoughts towards Christ? Um, and to be honest, I, I've never really known where exactly to come down on that. Um, I suppose I just, I, I'm not sure I have a solid stance on that at the moment, uh, personally. But I do know this, uh, the birth of Jesus is mentioned by three out of the four gospel writers, and it's not talked about very much, maybe partly because it's almost considered content that should be restricted to Christmas, and so we don't talk about it at other times of the year. So, so today we're going to be talking about the birth of Jesus. Uh, whether you want to frame that around Christmas or not, it's up to you. Uh, so... The birth of Jesus. I, I really want to share with you some reflections about what's known as the incarnation. Um, some people use the, those terms interchangeably, the birth of Jesus, the incarnation. When we use the word incarnation in a Christian context, uh, the word itself literally means going into flesh, entering flesh. Um, and so when we talk about it in a Christian context, it's referring to God taking on, uh, taking on flesh, taking on human form, uh, which is what we see in Philippians, described in Philippians 2, right? Though he was equal to God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead took on human form. Uh, so the incarnation, the birth of Jesus. Now, as I mentioned before, there are three separate accounts of Jesus' arrival into the world. Matthew, Luke, and John, all three of them give an account of uh, Jesus' arrival into the world. Uh, Mark jumps right into uh, adulthood and right into the narrative. It's Jesus already being grown up. It starts with John the Baptist and then the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Uh, and so Matthew and Luke... Uh, they have a very, what you might call a classic birth narrative. It's a birth narrative like you would think a birth narrative should be. It kind of describes the circumstances leading up to it. John is a little bit different. <laughs> John does cover the arrival of Jesus into the world. I'm not sure if I would call it a birth narrative, though. Uh, it's a little different. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at each of these individually. Uh, we're going to read them and then just see what we can pull out of there. So let's start with Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, we're going to be starting in verse 18. The book of Matthew actually starts with a genealogy. Um, and then right after that, we have the birth account. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, 
Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now there's more to the story than that. Right after this, we see uh, the response of the, the shepherds, the wise men, and how Herod politically responded to the situation. He felt rather threatened by someone who he thought might be a threat to his kingdom, and he ordered the slaughter of these young male children, and that led to Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fleeing to Egypt. So there's a lot more to the narrative that's entailed than what we're actually reading, but I really want to focus in uh, for now just on the birth itself and Jesus' arrival. Now Luke, Luke is a little bit different. Luke actually goes into a little more detail. Matthew's account focused more on Joseph and how he dealt with the situation. Uh, but in the book of Luke, we see Mary's perspective on things. So it starts with the birth announcement. This is in Luke chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So you have the birth announcement right there at the outset, um, this announcement that Jesus is going to be born. This is how it's going to happen. Uh, this is also what's happening with your relative Elizabeth, who gives birth to John the Baptist. So you have the announcement, and then later on you have the birth account itself. This is from Luke 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And that's the account that a lot of people remember. The, there's no room in the inn, and so they go, to, you know, they go to this farmhouse and swaddle him up in these blankets and put him in what would be really the feeding trough for the animals. Uh, you have this remarkable image of God, the creator of the universe, taking on flesh and ending up there. It, it really is remarkable. Now we come to the book of John. Now John, <laughs> John is special. Uh, John is less of a narratival account of how things progress chronologically. It's more what you might call a theological account of the arrival of Jesus. So listen to this. John 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. All right. There are a couple of important things to talk about here. First off, you have the question of Jesus' true identity and what these birth narratives or incarnation narratives really say um, about Jesus' identity. And then you have the matter of uh, what I call God's descent into the world. So let's deal with the first question here. R regarding Jesus' identity, uh, when you look at the Gospels, uh, each of the four Gospels, of course, Mark doesn't spend any time uh, with the birth narrative of, at all. But the fact that three of the four Gospels spend that much time talking about Jesus' arrival into this world, and, and Matthew and Luke's account go even farther, talking about some of the uh, external things that were happening outside of that. They spend an unusual amount of time on that topic. Now, this is unusual because typically what you would expect in any sort of uh, biographical account, which is, in some sense, what these Gospels are, biographical accounts telling us about Jesus and who he was, you wouldn't typically have much information about their childhood or, or, or their birth or co the conditions of their birth. Uh, it might matter who their father is, and that's kind of it. But three of the four Gospels go in tremendous detail talking about the circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus. Now, why is that? Well, I think it's because they're really trying to draw a direct line between Jesus' birth and the Old Testament prophecies about the arrival of the Messiah, the Christ, uh, the one who would bring about the spiritual and physical restoration and salvation of Israel and eventually the whole entire world. They're trying to connect his birth to that. And they're trying to connect him to that prophetic figure. I, I want to read to you a few different prophetic passages here. Uh, that are related to this discussion. We're going to start actually in the book of Micah. Micah chapter 5. Here we go. Micah chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. Uh, again, remember the accounts that we read, being born in Bethlehem uh, to Mary and Joseph. By the way, one of the things we didn't necessarily get too far into in the birth account uh, is that in Luke's birth announcement, um, the, the angel Gabriel, remember, told Mary that Jesus would take the throne of his father David forever. In the lineages that are given in both Matthew and Luke, we see that Jesus is a direct descendant of David and therefore has the right to the throne. That's important. So Micah chapter 5 verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Remember John 1's uh, account of 
in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was there in the beginning, and all things were made through Him, by Him, for Him. There you go. Therefore He shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of His brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and He shall stand and shepherd His flock in the strength of the Lord, uh, the image of shepherd Jesus as the good shepherd in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Jesus came and tried to offer peace. Of course, they killed him, but he's still going to bring peace to the world when he comes again. Now we go to 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, this is actually a passage we went over not too long ago on the show. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, this is known as the Davidic Covenant. So starting in verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's exactly what Jesus did. And that's the passage that's alluded to in Luke chapter 1 by the angel Gabriel. And then in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, starting in verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's the passage that's directly quoted in the book of Matthew. Isaiah chapter 11, chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's actually what Jesus remarks as he's reading uh, in the synagogue in uh, Luke chapter 4. And the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. So we see this vision of the Messiah and the Christ that's supposed to come into the world. And Matthew, Luke, and John, by giving the accounts that they did, they're trying to point and say, look, it's him. Do you see it? They're trying to show that Jesus is the Messiah. And these are just, I mean, this is a small sampling of passages. There are many more passages that deal with uh, Jesus' arrival, his life, death, and resurrection, uh, his purpose, uh, that tell us a lot about that connection uh, and about who Jesus was and is. So the point here being that Jesus is clearly identified as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the bringer of salvation uh, and the usher of the new covenant. But that's not all, by the way, because when we talk about Jesus' identity, it's not just that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the bringer of salvation uh, to Israel and to the world. Jesus is identified as God incarnate. Just like we mentioned the word incarnation earlier, coming into flesh, uh, Jesus being God incarnate suggests that Jesus is God. He has this divine origin and this continued divine identity even while he was there on earth. Uh, this is what you see explained out somewhat uh, in John's prologue, in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you have this equating with God in nature and purpose. Uh, it's been debated over the course of centuries what exactly that uh, relationship looks like. Um, Philippians 2, though, tells us that he was in the form of God. He had equality with God, but he was in human form, right? So John chapter 1, the Word was God, and then John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So God came to live with his people. Um, 
We're not going to get into a whole discussion about the metaphysical nature of the Trinity and that relationship between Father and Son, at least not right now. But the fact that God came down to live with his creation, to live with humanity, that is remarkable. I mean, that is just astounding. When you think about how things were back in the ancient world, especially when polytheism and false gods were really abundant, um, the mountaintops were typically considered the most holy places in ancient civilization. Because that was, at least at the time, uh, the closest that you could get to the dwelling place of God or to the dwelling of the, the gods, so-called. Uh, the closest you could get to the heavens, to the divine realm. And it was understood that the divine, the divine beings, uh, they, they were set apart from humanity. And, and to some degree, God or the gods weren't really all that concerned and interested in human affairs. Now, biblically speaking, I know this may sound shocking, but biblically speaking, it seems like there may, might be some truth to this. I don't think it's all true, but there's something to it. Go to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to start in verse 10. Here we go. Exodus 19, 10, and we're going to read 10 through 13. The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments. This is when God was about to descend on Mount Sinai uh, and give Moses the Ten Commandments. Verse 11, Be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people, and you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Well, that's interesting. You have God descending on a mountaintop, considered to be one of the most holy places, and sure enough, there God will be. But he says, you need to draw a boundary. The people, the Israelite people, they can't even get close. Why? Well, because they were sinful. Uh, they were tainted with sin. God is holy, and you are not. So stay away. Stay back. Don't get close. If you get too close, you're going to die being in the glory of God. It won't work, right? Uh, this is why there were physical barriers when we talk about the construction of the tabernacle and the temple. Um, God's presence was supposed to be in the middle of these things, and uh, there were these barriers. You couldn't get too close unless you, had, uh, unless you met certain qualifications and went through these purification rituals, uh, right? Because you don't just waltz into the presence of God casually. It's a big deal. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Here's an odd story. You have the Ark of the Covenant, which once again is supposed to symbolize the, the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant being brought into Jerusalem, and this happens. This is 2 Samuel 6 verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put his put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of God. Now, why did this happen? Well, first of all, they weren't carrying the ark the way they were supposed to. They had it up on a cart on top of some oxen. Uh, the instructions, if you look back at Exodus, is that they were supposed to, they had these long rods on either side, and you were supposed to have four people carrying it. Well, they weren't doing it right. And when it started to fall, he touched the Ark of the Covenant. Again, symbolized the presence of God, and he struck dead. Wow. Uh, again, coming into the presence of God. It's a serious thing. 
uh, after Adam and Eve had sinned. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, kicked out of the presence of God. Uh, in the Old Testament, man's sin made it impossible for God and man to peacefully coexist. Now here's the remarkable thing. All of that stands in tremendous contrast in glorious contrast to the incarnation, where God not only descends into the midst of sinful men, but takes on mortal form, suffering at the hands of sinful men. And as a result of mankind's sin, uh, there's something really telling there about God's character, isn't there? This doesn't sound like some far-off God who is totally unconcerned with human affairs. This sounds like one who is deeply invested in us. I want to read to you this passage from Philippians. I'm sure we've read it before, but it's a wonderful passage. This is Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That sounds like a God that's invested in humanity. The incarnation... See, it's a representation of God's desire to be with us. It's a representation of God's desire to be with his creation, to be with humanity. Um, it's a result of God's love for you, for me, and for everyone else. You probably know the passage, but I, I'm going to read this uh, anyway. Once again, helpful to hear. John chapter 3, verse 16, and I'll actually read uh, through verse 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. There's something about the incarnation that really is miraculous. And praise God for it. You might even say, Merry Christmas. It's been wonderful being able to spend this time with you. I want to thank you for uh, inviting me into your homes on this morning. Uh, and I'm sure you may have other obligations and responsibilities. Hope you have a wonderful uh, rest of the day. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the week. And hopefully I'll see you uh, on New Year's Day. May God bless you. See you then.